regenerate, the whole thrust here is about Jesus talking about him being the light, them thinking they're God, they're not. So the last couple of verses, 36, 39, is this coupling. He says, of him the Father set apart and sent into the world, do you, do you say thou blaspheme because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, and if you believe me not, believe the works so that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, but he went forth out of their hand. You see, the light of the world came into darkness. Not only did I want to receive it, they wanted to squelch it out. They wanted to snuff out the light. <laughs> it's, quite, it's one thing not, not to want to even cat the lambano, take to the light. Then you want to extinguish it. Just think about that for a second. So, just kinda, so you're hungry, you're, you're hungry and you're thirsty, and I come giving you a, 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 a top of the line chef meal. Top of the line, you pick, pick, pick your chef in your mind, whether it's you know, Wolfgang Puck or somebody, right? Some high-end French, I don't know, whatever you like, okay? Some high-end chef meal and delicious water, and you're hungry and famished, you're thirsty, quenching, and I give it to you. Not only do you not want to eat it, but you want to kill me. What? what? Why would you do that? Dude, you have a lot of hatred, don't you? You have a lot of problems with, with I don't know what's wrong with you, but you got some, that's not me, that's you. That has nothing to do with me. If I see you hungry and thirsty and I cook you this, this pristinely awesome chef-like meal and I give you this pristine water and you, don't, you just turn it over and destroy it and you want to kill me, then you got issues. You got some serious, that's what Jesus is saying there. You got some serious issues. Not only do you not like the light, but you want to extinguish the light. That's pretty sad. Look at John chapter 12, verse 46. John 12, verse 46. I have come a light into the world, so that he believing into me, into me, ongoingly believing into me, may not abide in darkness. That's John chapter 12, verse 46. Yes? Todd, said, can we please talk about the different sheep in verse 26, 27? How can these sheep be different types of sheep in typology? Okay. So when he's looking into um, you do not, but you believe not because you are not of my sheep, the reason they're different is because he's talking about the Jews are intended to be the head of a theocracy. And so the goal for a Jew is to be mature and to be mature has in view at least 30 fruit yield and up. And the culmination of, of being perfected is to go from 30 fruit yield to 100. So that's what he's talking about to the Jews. So remember, the Jews are always about the highest standard that God had intended for his children. So in verse 26, he's saying, you're not of my sheep. You're not of the people. In other words, the apostles that are following me, they're the ones that are taking on the following of my footsteps, as he mentioned earlier. They're not walking in darkness, as he mentioned earlier. And they're leading, them, they're leading a life unto becoming my probaton. They're going to be doing these things. The probata are the ones who, who hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Meaning, anybody who's wanting to get to know me, obey me, seek to love me by obedience, they're going to know my voice because they spend time in the Word and they spend time with me. So one's just the earmark in verse 26 of the high, high watermark, and verse 27 is the, is the lowest level from which one begins to hear the Master's voice is when you're in a fruit-yielding sense of following Him. So that's what he's talking about. Because he didn't just say, he didn't hear his voice, says, you know, you hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. There's three things going on there. They hear my voice, because you can hear his voice as a technon all day long, as a patty on all day long. But, he, he said thank you. but do you know him and do you follow him? No. The little sheep, little lambs follow the other sheep. They can't hear and understand. They're following the crowd, the masses. So the probata are the ones who actually are doing all three. They're hearing his voice, they're knowing him deeper intimately, and they actually, uh, they gnosko him, you can see there, and they also have, they follow him. So there's a difference in that process, they're doing all three. So, so then in John chapter 12, 46, Jesus said again, I'm the light, and I want those who follow me to not live in darkness. So that's John 12, 46. I have come in light to the world so that he believing into me may not abide in darkness. Then go to lastly, Re the, the book of Revelation, and we'll end our, our session here. Hey, Todd said, can you please wait? 
Can I do what? Can you please wait? Yeah, sorry. So in John 12, 26, we, John 12, 46, excuse me, we saw but Jesus saying slow down. we shouldn't abide in darkness. We're to walk in the light. So we don't want to dwell in darkness because he is the light. So obviously when he said John, 5, John 1, 5, that we're not supposed to cackle lumbana, we don't want to apprehend the light. We don't want to take it close to us. But he says, but you have to because if you don't, then how could you not? You're going to be falling into abiding in darkness, which if you don't. You have to hold that light. In other words, if you hold the light, it's real simple. If I hold the light outwardly, then I have, I have, a, I have, a, I have a chance that it's going to extinguish and not show me the light. Remember, the lamp is a light unto my feet. The lamp is a light unto my feet. The word is a light and lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I'm saying it backwards. The lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The lamp is a light unto my feet. He girds me up in gladness. He girds me up in gladness so that I can see the light unto my path, what's ahead of me. Do not understand that. So if he doesn't rip up the sackcloth, as he mentioned in Psalm 91, if he doesn't rip that up and gird me in gladness, he can't be a lamp unto my feet. How can he gird me up if I'm not by holding on to my, my, my sackcloth and my, and my ashes of my, my mourning and all my grief? He can't do that. Psalm 91 told you, don't be absorbed in grief. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's time and a place for it. I get it. But in the morning, you wake up to new joy. And he says, he girds you, lamp, lamp unto your feet, gird you with gladness, and a light unto my path. Now I can walk in the peripateo, the conduct of walking in light, so I won't abide in darkness ever because I'm girded up with his joy every morning. I'm, I'm the, the word's a lamp unto my feet, and now it's light unto my path, that now his presence is in my life going forward. He's always lighting the path before me. How can I possibly abide in darkness? He is shining the light of truth everywhere I look. It's good. So, yes. That's right. The darkness hates it's not sovereign. It's true. Satan's sin. He hated he wasn't saved. He didn't. All the good stuff the Lord had, it's like, I want to be able to provide this, not you. Yeah, Satan. <laughs> yeah, Satan wanted to credit. He wanted to control. He wanted to power. Yeah. So go to one last verse in the New Testament. So, uh, Revelation 21, verse 23. Revelation 21, verse 23. Our last verse, then we're going to go have our, our, our honoring of our Lord's Supper. Revelation 21, verse 23. And the city has no need of the sun, nor of the moon, that they might give light to it. For the glory of God enlightened it, and its lamp, its luknos, is the lamb. Say what? <laughs> oh, doesn't that bring a whole new interesting twist, doesn't it? Not only is Jesus the light of the world, not only is he not taken close by us in our sinful deeds, he has to impute our, that's why he, is the, the gift of God, is it something God gives you and you reach out? No, 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 no. John 1, 5 said we refuse to do that. He instead put the gift in our hand and said, take it. We said, well, okay, I will. Thank you very much. He put it in our hand, closed it up, and said it's yours. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. What is it? Oh, wow. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. That's the gift of God. You know, salvation, the, gr the grace of... It's our gift of God. No one should boast. Well, that, that's the gift of God. God puts it in my hand, closes it, and pushes it close to my chest and says, now keep that close to you. I go, what is it? Wow. Got it. It's filled with love <laughs> and, and, and promise and deliverance. Awesome. Right? So then he's, a, he's the looknose, it says. He's the looknose. We didn't desire him. He desired us. And then he says, not only is he the light of the world in darkness, we didn't desire him. Then he says, he's the light of Hanukkah that provides and sustains and takes away our grief and, and lights our, our path in front of us and girds us in a, in a stable fashion before all that. But then he says in the future, he's the light of the holy city. And not just that, he calls himself the looknos. The lamb is the looknos, which is interesting because the wise virgins took the lampus, but a looknos also of extra oil. <laughs> wow. So the lampus is a torch. And the looknos is the extra measure of oil that the foolish did not have, but the wise did. Because they recognize the source of light is not their mind or their heart, it's Christ. 
That's why you carry a looks nose. It's like carrying an extra measure of Christ's spirit with you. You cannot ever stop learning. You cannot ever stop being teachable. You cannot ever stop ripping up the sackcloth of your grief. Because as soon as you think all your sackcloth's been ripped up, God goes, yeah, you didn't get rid of that one, though. There's still some animosity and grief and mourning over here. Rip that one up. And you're like, okay, fine, I'll rip that one up, too. And he's like, rip them all up. That You can't go back to them. Stop doing that. And by the way, gird every morning with joy, even though you may end it with vexation and God's wrath of consequence of your, whatever. He, the psalmist made it clear to you that he, he gets it. Doesn't mean, you have an ob doesn't mean you're not out of, the out of the woods. You have an obligation to collaborative, like Aaron and his sons, continually keep his spirit lit in our life. That's our obligation. So with that being said, Jesus is our looks nose. He is our light. He is our lamp. He is our everything. And he is representation of what Hanukkah is about. He defied all odds, as he did in the days of Maccabean revolt and Judah Maccabee, who's known as the hammer. He does that in our life. Every day, if you look closely, even more than you realize. Every day, internally, externally, he's defying the odds and accomplishing things spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally, financially, that you never thought saw coming. But he does, and he will, and he's always on time. He's never late. He's never in a rush. He just does it on his time, his way. But I tell you, he's always good for it. He's always good for his word. And he's always going to be that lamp who, again, establishes us so he can then light our path in the future by us collaboratively, continually to keep his spirit lit in our life. But he is faithful. When we lose sight, he is faithful. He won't leave us. That's the beauty of Hanukkah. Represents our collaborative work keeps the whole spirit of Christ lit in our life. But when we do lose sight, and we do get off the horse, and we do get off the path, he puts us back in the path of righteousness because his oil, his love for us never runs out. It's our love for him that wanes. And then therefore we miss out on the extra measure of love we could have from him. We miss out on that enveloping, engulfing, loving embrace. Don't you want that? I don't want just the love of God. I want that warm embrace of enveloping love of God. That's what I want. And that, you have to collaboratively earn the right to do that by not letting your enemies get the last laugh, by standing up, by having God pick you up and make you stand and be resilient to understand and know that he is faithful and he will not want you to go and dwell on the old past griefs and mournings. Every day is a new joyful day, he said. So with that in mind, let's close in praying ready for, ready for our time of communion. Father, thank you for this time of remembrance of Hanukkah and your presence and your will in our lives and you continue to be faithful sustaining, giving, and providing us with your will and your love and your presence in our life. Be with us now as we remind ourselves of your last supper, of your opportunity you give to us to remind ourselves that uh, you provide ongoingly, even in this time of your last moments on this earth. We thank you and praise you for all you do and have done and are yet to do in our lives. In Jesus, Yeshua's name, amen. <coughs> so we're going to read, as we will, from the book of 1 Corinthians.